In the tradition-rich world of college football, there may be no fan base more adamant about being associated with the very concept of tradition than Texas A&M's. And if you disagree, you better prepare to get hissed at. We'll talk about it. Gridiron Traditions is built by The Home Depot. Let me establish up front that we're not gonna be able to get into every bit of what the Aggies are all about. For example, there is a glossary of Texas A&M related terms with 123 entries on Wikipedia. They're different and they like it that way. I know that at times Texas A&M can be off-putting to the outsider just because I think there's a learning curve, you know? like. I'm sitting here thinking we could probably talk for an hour about all of the things you would have to know in order to just be a halfway decent Texas A&M fan. There's lore. There's a manual. You know, there's something that there's something that's earned. Tradition was definitely a crash course for me when I went to A&M. And we have what's called fish camp. So before you enter your freshman year, uh, you can attend fish camp and learn all the traditions and stay overnight with other Aggies. We can start by getting to the Aggie of it all. The A in A&M currently doesn't stand for anything, but it used to stand for agricultural, as in Agricultural and Mechanical College of Texas, the school's original name when it became the first public college in Texas. In the early days, A&M students were referred to as farmers, but that morphed into Aggie. Aggie isn't just an athletics team nickname at A&M, nor is it limited to their fans. Texas A&M's official stance is, you're an Aggie from your first class and forevermore, which is also true of the 12th man. 12th man, one of the great home field advantages in college football. The 12th man doesn't end where the student section does. Nah, the school says the entirety of the student body from 1876 to today comprise the 12th man. This is a school whose enrollment has topped 70,000 for the last several years. And it feels like all of them and every former student jam into Kyle Field every game day. It is the only stadium with the three tiers that I know of in college football. It has a scale, which honestly is too big for AM, too big for any college football program. It is like falling into a stadium built for people who are bigger than humans, larger than humans from another place and have this entire other culture. Speaking of that culture, the origins of the 12th man, at least when it comes to A&M, date back to 1922, when the massive underdog Aggies knocked off Center College 22 to 14. Before that, the praying Colonels were undefeated and had outscored their opponents 320 to six. In the course of this historic bowl game, A&M suffered enough injuries to compel the appropriately named coach, Dana X. Bible, to call former footballer E. King Gill down from the stands. Gill had left the football team to focus on basketball, but he answered the call and stood ready should coach put him in. Mm, he didn't, and whether he was truly the last available player on the sidelines is apocryphal at best. But the readiness to serve, as A&M frames it, resonates deeply, especially at a school with a large, now voluntary core of cadets. As a concept, the 12th man predates all this, but it is A&M's trademark. Literally, like when the Seahawks were using the 12th man verbiage, they had to cough up a licensing fee. But the Aggies do put that ownership to good use because their fans root in an incredibly intricate way. They've been figuring it out the night before every home game since 1931 at Midnight Yale. I remember my first time going to Midnight Yale. I had no idea what I was in for or what was going to be happening there. And so the first time you're there, you're learning everything, how it's going to work. But the more and more you go, I think the more and more invested that you get in it. Midnight Yell is great because it's a cleverly disguised meeting. How else are you going to get a bunch of college students all on the same page on a Friday night? Make it a party. It's very, very, very clever. We got to get technical here. Aggies don't cheer, per se. They yell. And they've had books full of different yells for well over 100 years. That's why old-fashioned chants like Hollabaloo Connect Connect and Chigaruga Rim and Gig'em 
all persist today. Some will probably still say that their hissy horse laugh is a classy alternative to booing. If you want to get into where those came from, take it up with the fine folks on the Tex Ags forums. But you may rightfully wonder how everyone gets coordinated during games in Kyle Field, which isn't just gigantic, but also extremely loud. Not super conducive to coordinated shouting. That's where, since 1907, the Yale leaders have come in. They're the ones decked out in overalls or all white, depending on the occasion, who direct traffic. Despite what their title would suggest, they don't do that by yelling, but rather through passbacks, which are unique hand signals that get passed back through the crowd so everyone knows what yell is coming next. The most enduring of these is a simple thumbs up that signifies gigum, which fine, I'll tell you, somehow spraying out of a TCU horn frog hunting metaphor. But their most intense distaste for the mascots of their interstate rivals is reserved for Texas which in Aggieland is stylized as a lowercase tu, insinuating Texas is just a Texas university rather than the university of the Lone Star State. That rivalry thankfully kicks back off in 2024 following a 13 year pause. How the Aggies dislike for the Longhorns manifests visually looks pretty wholesome if you don't know what it is. When the 12th man puts their arms around each other and sways back and forth, it isn't to sing Kumbaya. It's to mimic the motion of a saw blade as they yell. Yep, they've been mad at them so long that Texas's nickname was just varsity back then. When that happens, it feels like Kyle Field is moving. It is such a trippy feel and look. You feel connected with the person next to you. You feel connected with your school, with the football game itself. And just kind of one of those reminders too of, of the rivalry between a and and Texas. While we're still on the subject of animals, let's give a shout out to Miss Rev. Of all the live animal mascots in college sports, of which there are a great number of good dogs, Reveille can pull rank. She is the highest ranking member in A&M's Cadet Corps. If she takes a nap in your bed, you gotta find somewhere else to lay your head because she's your superior. It's an honor to be in the presence of Reveille. It really is. Like, I remember seeing her on campus, even if she was far away, be like, oh my gosh, there's Reveille. And then when you got closer to her, you just are kind of in awe. She's even got the power to dismiss classes with a bark. Barks are what warranted her name when OG Reveille, a stray, a cadet mistakenly hit with his car, revealed that she'd been snuck back to campus to heal up by howling when a bugler played Reveille at wake up call. Every Reveille since the third has been a collie, and all nine of the now departed still get to keep an eye on the score from their resting places. Aggie fans have an interesting relationship with the scoreboard. Every point scored is an important enough occasion to kiss your date. But ignore the game clock up there. It only matters half the time. Should the Aggies be outscored, it only means that they ran out of time. Were football not the 60 minute game the rest of us agree that it is, A&M surely would have erased the deficit. The last full season they didn't have to confront that losing feeling more than twice was 2012, back when my former teammate, Mr. Jonathan Football Manziel, became the first freshman to win the Heisman Trophy. Given what you know now, it really shouldn't surprise you that a dude playing for Texas A&M would have a signature hand gesture. The swagger of the Money Manziel era represented the peak of A&M's cultural cachet, but its customs were predictive years before. Color out games of every possible hue are standard now, but that wasn't the case in 1998 when A&M had its first maroon out. Figuring out who did the synchronized matching shirt thing first might not even be traceable. We're not claiming that it originated in College Station because it didn't. Just saying, they did it six years before Penn State's first whiteout, and the Nittany Lions have been given plenty of props for being innovators in the space, so it's only right we acknowledge the Aggies were early adopters. And that's not usually their MO. They still have cannons, they greet each other by saying howdy, and they've got the biggest military marching band in the whole country doing those precise steps to those traditional tunes. Everyone gets very, very quiet for it and respects the band and listens to them. It's a very different experience than anything else you'll get out of a college marching band. 
And if you can watch them in a game where they play an HBCU team and they bring their band, you will get the greatest contrast of band styles I have ever seen in my life. A&M rebels in consistency and the position that you can't understand the Aggies from the outside and they can't explain it from the inside. But they have made strides for progress. They elected Ronnie McDonald their first black Yale leader in 1993. 2020 brought their first Hispanic Yale leader in Memo Salinas. And we're all holding out hope a woman Yale leader is around the corner. The Aggies deserve to boast about their status as perhaps the preeminent keepers of tradition in all of college football. But tradition is at its best when everybody feels like they have a chance to be making funny hand signals in front of 25,000 people at midnight. Let's hope things keep trending that way. This episode of Gridiron Traditions is built by The Home Depot. How doers get more done.